So, uh, growing up, like, like a lot of people, um, I always dreamed about becoming an astronaut. Um, I, used to, uh, my, I used to sit with my dad, actually. I remember watching Star Trek as a kid, uh, both the original series and then Next Generation when it came on. I had an older brother who was a big Star Trek fan. Uh, it, it was kind of a dream that never really died, actually, and probably until uh, almost the end of uh, graduate school. Uh, I remember when uh, some of you might remember if you were around Halley's Comet that, that came in 1986 and my parents took me to this, uh, there was a big Halley's Comet uh, uh, party. This was in California and I, I got my telescope. I was only nine at the time and uh, watching Halley's Comet and it really sealed my interest in, in both science and, and in space. Um, I'm actually a geneticist. Uh, that's a different story. but. Uh, uh, it, yeah, so Halley's Comet is actually coming back in, I, I don't know how many more years, about 50 years now. I think it's 2061 is when it returns, and it would be uh, a really awesome thing to be able to see that again. Uh, I remember a, as a kid, I actually convinced my parents to put up uh, space wallpaper uh, in my room, so all the walls were covered uh, in, in space wallpaper, except for, for one of the walls. I had this gigantic uh, wall size. It must have been about 7 feet by 10 feet. Uh, schematic of uh, one of the space shuttles. I think it was the Discovery. Uh, it was a cutout uh, lengthwise cross section. You could see every single wire and pipe and everything. Um, so I was a big space nerd. And uh, uh, one, uh, one of the things that's most vivid uh, in my childhood was when I was in, in grade school. Again, this was in uh, 1986 and uh, the space shuttle Challenger uh, accident. And I think. Uh, uh, a lot of you, if you were around then, quite uh, remember that as well. And uh, this, this was the, the crew there. And uh, one of the, this was a huge uh, event, and especially in the States, uh, and one that actually sent uh, the States in, in a, into a bit of a moral depression. Uh, part of the reason was that, that the top row there, second to the left, was uh, Christine McAuliffe. She was a teacher. And so... Uh, at the time of the space shuttle, sh space shuttle launch, every single student basically in the U.S. was watching this uh, live on television, and I was one of those kids watching it at the time, uh, and we saw the actual accident happen, and it was uh, quite a blow uh, watching a teacher and uh, have this happen. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of questions started uh, coming up after this happened uh, immediately, and trying to figure out what went wrong, where it went wrong, what were all the contributing causes. Uh, one of the people that was on the investigation team uh, was Nobel physicist uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, and at one point he said, for successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. Uh, and he said this uh, into the relation that NASA management at the time had believed that a catastrophic failure uh, uh, for a space shuttle was uh, on the order of about one in 100,000 events, whereas the engineers for NASA uh, were saying, no, a catastrophic failure was more on the order of one in 100 events. Uh, so there, there was a big disconnect between NASA management and NASA, NASA engineers. And so Richard Feynman was addressing this in this quote right here, that basically hype had taken precedence over the facts. Uh, and so then we have to ask the question, well, uh, where were the facts? Why weren't more people aware of the facts? Uh, if the engineers thought that it was one in a hundred and the management one in a hundred thousand, shouldn't we be able to analyze those facts and make a determination for ourselves? And so the investigation team went further and then discovered a series of lapses of uh, transparency and accountability in, in the entire NASA uh, infrastructure. Uh, it was actually known uh, by a few people, a few departments, that in extreme cold weather, these O-rings tended to break down, and they, they knew the rate that that breakdown occurred. The O-ring, of course, was the, the main contributing factor to, to the explosion. 
However, because there was a lack of openness going on at NASA at the time, uh, the right hand did not know what the left hand knew. Uh, and so management, uh, who end up making the final call in the absence of better information, will of course you know, uh, take public relations into mind and, and do what they think is best. This goes into other areas as well, of course. Uh, so this is the uh, now infamous uh, arsenic paper that came out in 2011. Uh, which, by the way, uh, has not been retracted yet. And I won't go into why it may or may have not been retracted yet. But the thing here is that uh, there's a lot of questions about the science behind this particular paper. And for those who may not know, uh, this paper uh, basically says that uh, phosphorus, which is the, one of the main building blocks of DNA, can be replaced by another substance called arsenic. Uh, and still have life occur uh, in this particular bacterium. Uh, a lot of people debate this quite fiercely, uh, saying that no, there were contaminations in the experiments uh, and the, uh, the reagents being used at the time. Uh, but what's hard to get at is uh, one thing, what were the reviewers saying about this during the initial drafts of this paper? Uh, where's all the data for this? Uh, which still hasn't been completely uh, forthcoming from the lab that, that did these experiments. If we could actually see the history of this uh, paper, how it came to be, why people decided that these conclusions were in fact correct, uh, I think we would be able to make more informed decisions. Um, maybe that we'd be able to see that this paper should never have been published at all uh, until further experiments were, should have been done. Uh, which is what leads me to believe that openness is, is vital to the future of science and kind of the reason that I'm here today. Uh, and uh, because of this belief, uh, uh, I co-founded along with Pete Benfield, who used to be the publisher of PLOSC One, uh, which is the world's largest open access journal. Uh, we co-founded Peer J uh, last year. Uh, uh, at the same time, I also co-founded uh, a new baby uh, he's our, uh, he's wearing the, the Pure J mascot t-shirt there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he likes us just for the monkeys, actually. Uh, uh, highly advisable not to have a baby at the same time you're, you're starting a, a new publishing company. Uh, but uh, Pure J is an open access, fully peer reviewed journal. Uh, and the reason we, we wanted to start PeerJ was that we had three goals. We wanted to expand quality open access uh, options that scientists have available to them. We wanted to increase the transparency in the system, uh, and then by way, accountability as well. Uh, and then a third thing, which is uh, perhaps uh, less relative to why we're here today, but reduce inefficiencies in the academic publishing market. Uh, and to accomplish this then, we had three strategies that we set out a year ago. Uh, the first thing that we discussed, Pete and I, was we wanted to uh, have open peer review. Uh, we also wanted to reignite preprints in the life sciences, something that's um, in other fields, such as physics, obviously, and mathematics is, is quite popular, but in life sciences has uh, died down in the last few decades. Uh, and then we wanted to make it very, very cheap. Uh, to reduce these inefficiencies in publishing. And so we charge uh, a person just $99 to get all you, can, uh, all you want publishing. Uh, so the first thing, uh, it's not enforced open peer review, but rather optional uh, open peer review, uh, both for the reviewers who want to name themselves and uh, for the authors who want those uh, reviews done. And I, I think this is actually the, the right decision rather than forcing uh, open peer review. Uh, there's a lot of data that shows that forcing ethics onto people is actually uh, has the counter effect. Uh, people start doing unethical things, and it's actually better to incentivize these types of things uh, happening. Uh, so all versions of the manuscript, uh, for those who do elect to have uh, open peer review, are shown. You can go to any article page and see the history, the, the drafts uh, through time. You can also see the reviewer's comments, the editor's comments, and then the rebuttals from the authors as well. Uh, and so just a few stats in on this. Uh, so, so far 68% of authors are choosing to share their peer review history. 
uh, and between 12 and 20% of all page view traffic is actually going to those reviews. And it's very interesting then to see uh, people's reactions to these peer reviews. There's just a couple tweets there. Uh, we have people from grad students seeing for the first time what the peer review process is like. Uh, uh, we have people uh, pointing to it and saying, ah, I was always screwed over uh, when I went through peer review and I'm glad that uh, the process is finally out in the open because it makes the whole system fair, uh, more polite as well. Uh, I think it also uh, gives reputation to people uh, if they're able to, uh, if they have the confidence to name themselves uh, and, and build it up. And it creates a, a higher quality review in the end if you know that your name's gonna be placed alongside. Uh, so 42% of the reviewers then are currently choosing to publicly sign those reviews. Uh, and then with preprints, uh, currently we, we just uh, released preprints in fact a week ago and we're doing a, a one per day. Uh, in fact, there's a couple in the queue to, to come out today. Uh, and, and one of the things that why we wanted to reignite preprints was, uh, you know, especially in the life sciences, uh, it started out as a preprint culture uh, where you just got your stuff out there and then you let the post-publication reviews come in uh, and then maybe you rethink your conclusions, come up with more data. Uh, and in fact, uh, peer review was not formalized really until the mid uh, 20th century. Uh, so we had all these journals previous to that uh, uh, doing non-peer review uh, and famously actually the Watson Crick uh, Double Helix uh, paper was never peer reviewed by nature. Uh, which kind of indicates then that uh, uh, peer review, although very, very beneficial, uh, is not always necessary in order to advance science. Uh, uh, but rather at some point, uh, the post publication review actually becomes uh, the more important element as things are democratized and we, we learn uh, the truth about things. Um, with post-publication review, for instance, with the arsenic paper, we're only figuring out just now that, wait, wait a second, these things are not completely right. Uh, so the third point then on reducing inefficiencies in the academic publishing market. Um, so it, some people have calculated that uh, from all the life science journals or articles being published each year, you can figure out the average value to about 5,300 US dollars uh, per article being spent uh, based on subscription fees and open access APC charges. Um, and taking that calculation then based on the numbers since we started publishing, we're saving uh, the academic market about 315,000 US dollars per year already uh, because they don't have to subscribe uh, to the journal uh, and they don't have to publish uh, these authors or pay to publish ever again. And that number is gonna continue to rise, of course. Uh, and we've recently started uh, handing out institutional memberships as well. So we have here in the UK, University of Birmingham and Nottingham. Uh, and in these situations then, the universities are buying their faculty and uh, other researchers uh, lifetime memberships to Peer J. Uh, and saving quite a bit, basically for the cost of one year's journal subscription, they're buying their entire faculty a lifetime membership to publish, uh, which is uh, a great uh, motivating thing to see. Uh, so I guess I'd just like to leave you uh, with one final thought that, uh, you know, we have a lot of problems in science that uh, transparency and accountability um, can really help us uh, solve and increase uh, the rigor, which is why we're here uh, today, uh, of the peer review process uh, and of uh, the, the speed and efficiency of, of publishing. Uh, so I'm very excited anyway to uh, join this panel and uh, take your questions later on, that's all. Thank you.